So this next section in Mark's Gospel appears to be a collection of uh, simple miracle stories. But in fact, each of these incidents has their own particular teaching point. And there is also a point of commonality uh, to these uh, short stories. And that is that Jesus is looking to limit his profile as a miracle worker. And we see this both in the silencing of the demons by not allowing them uh, to speak his name uh, and also by urging the uh, leper who he healed uh, not to speak of the miracle. And we're going to look at those uh, as we go through the message. But overall in this passage, what we see is Jesus fully in control of his mission and yet clearly broken and moved uh, by the suffering that he encounters as he goes about his ministry. So the first encounter is when they go uh, to the home of Simon Peter. And uh, it's evident that they've gone here, uh, whether to dine or to rest or to have a meeting. They haven't specifically gone uh, to carry out this miracle of healing. It's only when they arrive, they discover that uh, Peter's mother-in-law uh, has this fever and they ask Jesus if he can minister to her. And the story is included uh, as a way of demonstrating Jesus's immense power and authority over sickness. And we see this in the way that the fever immediately left uh, this woman and uh, straight after she got up and she began to wait on them. So we see here uh, the instantaneous and full recovery uh, of this woman. But there's something else that's being said here by virtue of the fact that Jesus clearly didn't go to that house to heal a person, but rather when he found someone who was ill, uh, he healed her. The point being that we're seeing that wherever Jesus goes, there is a need, a physical need for him to minister to. Whether or not it's a demon-possessed person or whether or not it's someone suffering from a long-term or short-term ailment, wherever he goes, Jesus encounters the suffering of mankind. And then we see at the end of this little passage here that the whole town had gathered at Peter's door. Now, we saw earlier uh, that after the exorcism in the synagogue, uh, that word spread throughout the region. So in the days before newspapers, radio, television, uh, social media, we see that word spreads like wildfire. And all these people come uh, to Jesus's door or to the place where he's staying. And we notice that this is when evening has come. And there's this sense here in which, you know, Jesus ministers all day long. And then come the evening, there's no rest, there's no respite. The ministry continues. So huge demands, understandably, are being placed on Jesus. Everywhere he goes, he encounters need. So we also see here that Jesus uh, cast out many demons, but he would not permit them to speak. And this clearly uh, ratifies what had happened earlier uh, in the synagogue in verses 23 to 24, where the demons, you recall, cried out, what do you want with us? Please don't torment us. Jesus would not allow the demons to speak. Now, there's a number of reasons uh, why this might be the case. Uh, firstly, uh, Jesus would not want uh, the situation to be misread in the sense of he would not want uh, any suggestion that he was somehow in cahoots with the devil. We will see this accusation uh, later on. You know, he casts out uh, demons by the name of Satan. And Jesus, of course, challenges the absurdity of that. Uh, but he didn't want the situation to be misread, any kind of connection uh, between the forces of darkness and the Son of God himself. 
There's also a sense in which Jesus uh, did not want to draw attention to his power and authority over the forces of darkness, but rather he wanted his true identity to emerge from the very nature of his teaching and preaching. He wanted to be known uh, for the wholeness of what he brought to that mission of the gospel, not simply uh, the spectacular casting out of demons. And related to that then is a third reason about drawing the wrong kind of attention. There's this idea that the miraculous, which is still true today, is a huge a draw to crowds. There are the curiosity seekers who want to see something spectacular. And Jesus is here trying to avoid uh, this kind of carnival aspect to his ministry. He is the worker of miracles, and it's understandable that these crowds would come uh, not just to take advantage and to have their own problems dealt with, but to see a man cast out demons uh, or to heal the sick. But there's another reason why Jesus would not permit the demons to speak of his name. And that is because they were not truly confessing the name of Christ in the way that the gospel calls us to. We confess the name of Jesus uh, through repentance and faith, a recognition of his sovereignty and his ability alone to save us from our sins. That's not why the demons are calling out his name. And so Jesus says, you don't get to speak my name unless it is in repentance and faith. So Jesus demonstrates his power again over the forces of darkness. In his mercy, he casts out these demons, but he will not permit them to speak his name. There's also a sense here in which uh, Jesus is not kind of front loading uh, the fullness of his identity. He understands that the journey of realization where we grasp who he truly is, is a journey that takes a long, long time. He very gradually revealed the fullness of himself uh, to his disciples. It took them at least three years to begin to grasp that he was the Christ, the Holy One of God. And even then, it wasn't until the day of Pentecost that things really changed and they fully grasped who he was. And in the same way, Mark gradually reveals the identity of Jesus. This is not simply a one-off in which he goes into the synagogue, uh, proclaims uh, his name, preaches authoritatively from the scriptures, casts out a few demons, and the job is done. This is a process where the world had to understand who God is and what his purpose was in coming to uh, work and live amongst mankind. This is a gradual a journey of realization. And we should take heart uh, that our understanding of God through the Lord Jesus Christ can take many, many years. It's impossible for us to grasp everything in a short period of time. But as we continue to look over the scriptures, uh, we find that picture becoming clearer and clearer. And that's the approach that Mark takes. He's introducing us to these various aspects of the Lord Jesus, his power over scriptures, his power over sickness, his power over uh, the demons. And piece by piece, we're getting to know who he really is. So having witnessed a miracle of healing of this fever of Peter's mother-in-law, and then this uh, note about him healing uh, the sick and casting out demons, we then find Jesus withdrawing to a solitary place. And he does this very early in the morning. And there are two things uh, that Mark tells us in this short passage. Firstly, that Jesus needed that space alone to commune with his father. 
He simply could not sustain his ministry without regular one-to-one communion with his heavenly father. And solitary uh, places were very difficult for him to find as word spread uh, of his power and his works. It was more and more difficult for him to find that space. And that's the second thing that Mark shows us, that the disciples track Jesus down and they say to him, everyone is looking for you. Crowds are following Jesus wherever he goes, understandably. And so it's difficult for him to find those times of solitude. Jesus wants to reiterate here that first and foremost, he is a preacher of the gospel. He has come to instruct in the way, the truth and the life. He does perform miracles. They are signs of his divine authority, but he has not come primarily to heal the world of physical and spiritual ailments, but more so he has come to teach them the good news of the kingdom of God, which is found in Jesus himself, not in the things that he can do for people, but for all that he is in and of himself. And so Jesus says, let us go to a place where I'm free to preach the true gospel, where uh, I can escape from these crowds. Jesus loves the world and he wants to heal. But more important than that is his ability to convey the full truth of the gospel. So Jesus then travels throughout Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. So Mark tells us that as Jesus goes about the business of preaching the gospel, there is this onslaught of demonic activity, and we mustn't downplay the significance of that. Look at Paul's words to the Ephesians. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Jesus faces opposition, and the forces of darkness pursue him at every turn. They want to undermine his ministry, to take him away from his core goal, of being that sacrificial lamb of God, of healing the world, of bringing in God's supreme rule and authority. Jesus is rattling cages and the demons are responding. So we then come to this uh, final uh, miracle uh, in this particular passage here with the leper. And so far, Mark hasn't given us any particular indication as to how people asked for healing. And it's not a question we would uh, particularly think to ask. We would just assume if somebody was uh, sick uh, that they would come and say, Lord, will you heal me? Uh, Or maybe just try and touch his robe or something like that. We don't think too much about the means by which people requested healing. But here we see this leper ask Jesus, are you willing? Now, his condition as a leper put him firmly in the camp of the outcast. In this sense, he was desperately unclean. And indeed, lepers would have to herald uh, their arrival by crying out and declaring, unclean, unclean. They had to make themselves known as somebody who uh, was desperately, desperately ill. And so the leper, as a known outcast approaches Jesus and says, Lord, are you willing? And there's something very revealing here about the leper's humility. There's no doubt he understood Jesus's power to heal. The issue here is not whether Jesus could, but whether or not he would. And in verse 41, we read that Jesus was indignant Now, some translations uh, will uh, have this written as angry. Jesus was angry. Uh, Some translations say he was filled with compassion. But the word indignant uh, 
captures something of the character of Jesus. The sense in which he is angry, not at the leper, because he goes on to heal him. He's not indignant or angry at the leper. He's indignant at the leper's condition. You see, Jesus' heart breaks for sin and the effects of sin. The fall brought about death and destruction to the whole of creation. And that's why we have sickness and disease. And as Jesus looks upon this poor man, he sees a condition that ought never have been. That in the world that God created, there was no sickness, there was no death, there was no disease, there was no heartbreak. And one day those things will be eliminated and we'll live in this glorious city where there are uh, no tears and no death. But now Jesus looks down at this poor, wretched man. He sees him look up with these desperate, pleading eyes, and he is moved with compassion. That Jesus would show mercy to a social outcast like this leper shows us the boundless reaches of God's mercy. He loved the man, and he was, of course, willing to heal his sickness. But Jesus tells the leper to keep this story to himself. But then Jesus knows all things, and he knows exactly what the leper will do. He won't be able to keep his tongue from praising and proclaiming, and that's exactly what he does. He goes out and tells of all that's been done for him. So if Jesus did not want the attention, if he sternly warned this man not to speak of his name, knowing that the man would do that very thing, why did Jesus go ahead and heal him regardless? Because he was filled with compassion. There's a sense in which Jesus cannot help himself. And I say that guardedly because, of course, Jesus is full of self-control. And yet we see this extravagant outpouring of grace and mercy that when Jesus sees those who are desperate and in need, he is so moved with compassion that he stretches out his hand to heal. We noted previously that Jesus is fully in control of his mission, and indeed he is, but he is also overwhelmingly uh, full of compassion and mercy. And we need to seize hold of this image. A man who is fully in control of his mission and yet so fully moved to the very core of his being. God loves the world so much. And we see this manifested here in the gospel where Jesus is so moved to reach out to the world that needs him. So in this uh, short passage where we have uh, these miracles and exorcisms and we have this insight into Jesus's need uh, to keep his miracle working profile to a minimum, we see that he is still in control of his mission. He still sets the agenda and yet we see how relentless God is in his compassion towards the world. We see Jesus faithfully carry out this preaching and teaching ministry, all the while healing those who cry out to him. In these times of immense testing, it is important, it is vital for us to see God's immense power, but also his boundless compassion. We see in Jesus a God who is not just able to minister to every one of our needs, but a God who desires to do so. So great is his love that he is able and he is willing. <laughs>